Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we're talking with Jonathan Oxier. Jonathan is the New York Times bestselling author of Strange Stories for Strange Kids. His novels include the Peter Nimble series, the bestselling Night Gardener, and the award-winning Sweep, the story of a girl and her monster. Jonathan's newest series, The Fabled Stables, is in bookstores now. Jonathan grew up in Canada and currently lives in rainy Pittsburgh with his family and their adorable pet umbrella. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Of course. Thanks for being here. So, Jonathan, I want to start where we always do for this season, which is, you know, you've got this strong presence in the middle grade sector. You're, you're, you know, writing a screenplay. You've written a screenplay. But if you could pinpoint the moment where you felt like you broke into the writing world, when would you say that moment was when you felt like you were really where you belonged? Um, well, those are two different questions, right? Um, kind of breaking in. So I, I, I came out of the gates um, kind of fast and then faltered, uh, which is sort of how I operate often. <laughs> um, uh, so it actually, um, before I was writing books, um, I had a manuscript for my first book, uh, Peter Nimble, um, which is a story about a small blind orphan who also happens to be the greatest thief who ever lived. And I had this manuscript kind of sitting in a drawer, but it's not, I hadn't planned on writing middle grade books or books at all. Um, I planned on, I, I studied playwriting. I got my MFA in playwriting. Um, and then I, over the course of that experience, realized what I really, I had a more visual sense, storytelling sense. So I moved to Los Angeles to become a screenwriter um, and did this thing everyone does, right? Where they're just kind of hustling and trying to meet people and breaking into that world. And and I was, you know, I was working on my screenwriting. Um, and uh, there's, so so in terms of like getting kind of a foot in the door, I, I literally had a, a, a truly like one of a kind moment where, you know, I was hustling. I ended up kind of falling upwards into a situation where I was produ- producing poker TV shows, which was, I suppose, industry adjacent, but I didn't really like <laughs> a lot. It wasn't, you know, it just it had nothing to do with what I actually want to do, which is tell stories um, specifically for kids. And um, but I was I was kind of hustling and trying to write stuff. And I basically had a friend who was a junior executive at a network and he and I had kind of known each other for a while. And he had a little bit of money from his boss basically to develop a show and they had run out of options. So he he uh, called me into the offices and said, like, we're going to lock ourselves in a room for like two days and come out with a show. And we ended up coming up with a show uh, that they bought. Um, it's it a terrible show <laughs> and it didn't go anywhere. But I got I got paid for that. And literally, as I'm as I'm riding home, uh, we all you know drove to a restaurant or something to you know celebrate. As I'm riding home, uh, my phone starts blowing up with all of these messages because a screenplay I had written had made it not even that high up, but somewhere on the nickel fellowship list. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the screenwriting world, but there's a handful of basically um, contests for screenwriting that have a little bit of weight and then a whole bunch of really lower tier ones that that don't do anything for your career. But the nickel is a big deal. um, And if you win it, it, you probably really do get your foot through the door. Um, and basically this, my script did not come close to winning even, but it was a finalist and they published the, the log line and the, the description of that script, you know, to a whole bunch of managers and things. And suddenly I had all of these managers reaching out. So as I'm driving home from selling a TV show randomly, <laughs> like with these people that felt like it fell in my lap, my phone is blowing up with people who are interested in this movie I wrote Um, and that was, that was a great, that was a very exciting feeling. Um, I had, I had been really determined to, uh, I think get an agent before I was 25. Um, and I think I was like 25 and three months or something when it happened, which, um, uh, and so in some ways that felt like breaking through and breaking into, you know, very closed industry at times. I mean, I knew people who spent years and years trying to, you know, I ended up getting repped by, you know, a pretty significant agent and, and kind of entering that world. Um, but the reason your question is a little thorny is because uh, kind of concurrent with those opportunities, um, first of all, it's not like uh, fame and fortune was falling into my lap. That could have changed things perhaps. But, you know, I'm hustling and I'm developing things and doing all this stuff. I'm also learning some things about myself as a human being and as a creative person, a storyteller. Um, and uh, the main thing I was learning is that I didn't really have um, sort of the temperament that is necessary to survive as a screenwriter. 
Um, I, I, I clearly had been developing, you know, dramatic writing kind of chops over that time. And I had a long way to go, but I, I had some skill. There was real talent there. And I, but um, I just didn't really have, again, I, temperament is the only word um, I can say. And, and, and also the opportunities I, I was, you know, you're, you're scrambling to pitch yourself on a, I mean, this was, you know, like, I don't know, 2007, eight. Um, uh, oh, I should say, right. Like the week I signed with my agent, the writer strike started. So I couldn't actually meet with anyone. So there were, <laughs> I got kneecapped in weird ways, but I was like figuring out, you know, I'm like, you know, we, we have the rights to this board game. Can you pitch us an idea for that? I mean, it's stuff like this. And I'm like, A, there's no money involved. They're just asking me to kind of come spend all this energy coming with a take because I'm, I'm nobody. And B, uh, I just was figuring out very quickly that I, I was not a great writer when I was working with someone else's ideas and characters. Um, and that, um, uh, I really needed ownership over what I did. So kind of on nights and weekends while I was kind of hustling and, and paying my bills screenwriting, which is no small thing. I'm proud of that, but I was not proud of the stuff I was working on. I was getting to a point where I was relieved every single time something fell through, um, wishing maybe I'd gotten paid a little bit more, but, but kind of happy that I wasn't out there with my name on it. Cause I, I wouldn't have paid money to see it in a theater. Um, and, uh, and so then on nights and weekends, I kept picking away at this manuscript I had written, you know, before even moving to LA. Um, I didn't know a lot about writing books, uh, but I, I just, I must've done seven or eight page one rewrites over that time. Um, and in that time started to really realize that I, um, I was the sort of writer who really needed to tend my own garden to really have full ownership of these characters. Um, which isn't to say that the, the characters I write in my my middle grade books are perfect, but the mistakes in those books, they're my mistakes. <laughs> and that was something I needed that, that full, that full buy-in. Um, and so uh, actually when my, uh, my, my screenwriting agent got uh, a copy of my, my first book's manuscript, um, I knew no one in publishing and he wanted to try to set up as a movie because that's what people do. And it felt like a commercial idea. And it was this hard line, you know, he was someone I was afraid to say no to. And I was like, nope, this is a book. And so he sort of threw a tantrum and like called some people to find me a book agent. And, um, and so I landed with a book agent, Joe Regal, who I'm still with and I adore. And within two seconds of talking to this guy, I realized he was in a completely different kind of animal than most of the people, not all, but most of the people I was encountering in Los Angeles. He was an actual reader. Um, he was just a really kind of deep thinker and, 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 was really saw something in the book and saw something in me. And, and I realized I wanted to be in that world and really nothing changed every single time I met with publishing houses and editors and agents in the book world. I, I just felt much more at home with those people. Um, and so it's been a really happy fit between, you know, a thing I love doing. I wanted to write stories for kids and, you know, my screen plays were kind of a little too weird for for you know they were like too weird and too big budget it was a bad combo that way um but within middle grade they are considered like highly commercial uh premises um the same sorts of stories so it was just the right fit uh for me um and i've never looked back i love it so much so you mentioned writing for a younger audience and how your your scripts weren't going that way where, where was it in your writing that you realized that writing for a younger audience would was preferable to writing for an adult audience? Uh, that's always been kind of something I've known about myself. I always, I, I loved kids growing up. Like even as a kid, I liked working with kids <laughs> and being around like younger kids. Um, and, and uh, you know, I was, I mean, there aren't many like, I don't know, high school boys who were like loved to babysit and things like that. I really did. Um, and I'm still to this day, a little bit more comfortable interacting with kids than I am with adults. Um, and, uh, or at least I, I can access parts of myself. I can be a little sillier and a little more playful with kids than I can with adults. Um, and so I always kind of had, had my eye on the ball for that, but I, uh, again, it was just, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's just, everyone has different aptitudes. Um, there were little things about screenwriting. I I'm totally veering off from your question. I hope that's okay. Fine. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I, I learned, and I think it's really true about, about screenwriting work, and I do some screenwriting work still um, when I can, but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely careful about like how much time I burn on it because it can really s take everything out of you and give back nothing. Um, but to be a screenwriter, you really need the ability to hold several projects kind of in your 
in your mind and your consciousness at once and they're all on hold. And then someone calls and says, you know, we need, you know, you did put a little work into this and you jump right on that for two weeks and then you give it to them and then you have to jump to the next thing. And there are a lot of writers who, who get a bump of energy off of that and they actually keep some going. And so when I talk about not having the temperament, I'm not that writer. I would say it takes me three solid weeks of zero progress to switch from one story to another. And that would be fast for me. Um, I, it takes me an enormous amount of time to pull my head out of one story and, and put it into another. And so when I'm dealing with two stories, let alone two, three, four, five stories with pitches and, and you know, people are sending you IP and things like that. It's, uh, I, I literally just can't do it at the, the speed that's needed. Um, so again, it's not like I was too good for Hollywood. Um, but it was a little bit like, this is, this is going to be a hard fit moving forward, even if things really break my way, I'm going to be pretty miserable um, trying to fit myself into this rhythm. So how did that work with writing your, because it sounds like you were writing, you mentioned you're writing screen plays during the week and then your off time, you were writing <laughs> Peter Nimble. How did it work with, with that division of, of having to focus on one story and then switch to another in your off time? Uh, again, I, I don't know. I, that was a little while ago. <laughs> I mean, my guess is I was really just writing Peter Nimble the whole time and not really able to bring everything to bear in those projects because I wasn't again terribly excited about them. I was excited about the chance to sell something and, and have some success. Very, very rarely did I get to even pitch on something. And, and a handful of times I had an opportunity to pitch on dream projects. Um and and actually uh at least two instances I can recall now, um I, I actually turned down I, I declined to pitch on them. Uh somehow I, I didn't I, I think I was, again, af afraid of working on someone else's material, um, afraid of getting my heart broken, afraid of having it taken away from me. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I've, I just, I don't know. It just felt like not what I wanted to do. I have no idea if that makes sense or is even healthy as a writer, but that's kind of where I ended up. It makes sense. Um, I want to ask about finding your voice as a middle grade writer. Cause I feel like of all genre or of all age ranges, middle grade is so voice heavy. How did, did the voice come to you naturally writing for a younger audience or did was it something you had to sort of teach yourself? Um, so my voice has changed over the last couple of years. I mean, I think my first book, Peter Nimble is, is a much tweetier, uh, very narrator first uh, voice. And it's actually, I'm writing a, a third Peter Nimble book right now. And it's, it's actually hard for me to get back to that space. Um, but in terms of, um, kind of a, a voice for children's, there's kind of two pieces, which is, you know, I, I've been obsessed with children's books my whole life. My wife has a PhD in children's literature. Um, it's kind of something we live and breathe. And I really like sort of the golden age. So like Victorian and Edwardian children's books are stuff I, I really adore. And so I'd really internalized a lot of that voice. Um, and the thing that I remember consciously trying to do with Peter Nimble was basically take what I knew about, 20th, 21st century story structure through playwriting and screenwriting. Um, and, and basically use that story structure with a story that feels like it could have been written otherwise, you know, 150, 200 years ago, um, 200, too far, 150 years ago. <laughs> uh, and cause I thought that would be a very powerful combination, you know, like what if, what if Alice in Wonderland was not a structural mess um, I think it would be really great. I mean, I love Alice in Wonderland for all its qualities, but, uh, but, you know, Carol really had no idea how to shape a story that moved quickly and built and, and, and did all the things that it, I think contemporary story structure can really do. Um, the other piece of it was, is something that I, um, I've also felt for a really long time, which is I'm, I'm extremely sensitive to depictions of children in media. Um, and specifically, and, and I, I can't say for certainty if I'm doing it right, but I really, really hate it when it's done wrong. Um, I really hate these kind of super kind of twee, ultra precocious children um, uh, written by adults who don't seem to have a, a real understanding of how kids operate, or at least their sense of it is different than mine, I guess. Um, uh, and that's something I've always been extremely sensitive about. And, I, and so from the get-go, I, I just had this, extreme desire to write what felt to me like authentic child characters um, because I, I felt like I wasn't seeing that as much as I wanted to. Um, so you've got five books out there now, I believe in, in the middle grade sector. Did it, 
How has the process changed for you? I think you mentioned on your website that Peter Nimble took 15 complete rewrites. Did like sweep take that long too, or have they, have they gotten oh. easier, so to say? No, they, they do not get easier. Um, so I am slower than most middle grade writers. And again, this is also where I didn't work with screenwriting and I've been incredibly fortunate. There's a lot of kind of privilege. I think that, that is, is worth kind of observing. Um, I've been fortunate enough in publishing has been kind to me. And there are a lot of very, very talented writers, much more talented than I am, who even get a chance to publish a book and it just doesn't find a readership and there's, they can't quit their day job. Um, I, I was able to quit my day job that day I was riding in the car and my phone blew up. I've been writing full-time since within middle grade. I've been able to not only write full-time, but write, publish much more slowly. Uh, most middle grade writers um, have to kind of do a book a year to just keep the machine going. And I'm a book every two to three years. Um, and, uh, and that's been, I, I, again, I'm just a, a slower processor. I'm a fast talker, slow thinker. Um, and, uh, and I can't remember your question. Uh, if writing the books have gotten easier oh, since the time. No, Peter goodness, <laughs> no. no. So my most recent novel was sweep and sweep took about 15 years all told from the beginning of the idea to the end. Um, and, and I would say about seven of those years were, were hard, like long pushes with really aggressive failures over and over again. Um, it, the truth is I have learned that I'm, um, the only book I basically forced the creation of in under three years was the companion book to Peter Nimble, um, which again, three years is still a long time, but like I had no premise. I had no main character. I had no world, no plot. And I went from absolutely nothing to finished book in about three years, which is much more time than most writers take or many other writers take. Um, and it was it, uh, hands down the most uncomfortable writing experience of my life. I, I really at any moment, really what I'm doing is writing the story that I started uh, getting a feel for five to 10 years earlier. Um, and that's, so one of the lessons I've learned is I can't let the, the tank empty. Um, like I need to be hatching stories right now that I'm actually going to be able to execute successfully in five to 10 years. And if I, sometimes I've forgotten or gotten a little overwhelmed and, and suddenly I realized there's a gap where I haven't been kind of filling that well. <laughs> um, and so, but it's always been slow and I wish it were faster. I know a lot of writers who are, you know, there's a romance about being slow and it's like slow and steady wins the race or, you know, quality over quantity. But I know some very fast writers who are just excellent at their job and happier than I am. So really I'm, I'm, I'm missing everything. <laughs> I'm doing it all wrong at every turn. That's interesting though. So does a story have to cultivate in you for a while before you start writing it? Or do you just start writing and see where it goes? Um, I'm sure it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I will, sometimes I will over plan and, and if I actually just shut up and s write it, so there'll be some discoveries, but generally speaking, I need to, um, something that I've, that, that, that I struggle with, um, that I, I don't think other writers deal with quite as acutely or not, not all of them. Um, I am all virtually incapable of moving forward unless I feel like what I, what is immediately behind me felt true. It doesn't have to be good, but it has to feel true. A lot of writers have a lot of success by just getting something down and then they'll fix it, you know, in the next draft. That's a very healthy approach. It's a practical approach. It's more efficient. Um, I, I, for whatever reason, um, writing, uh, uh, even a moment, a scene, you know, a line, <laughs> in a, in a, in a manuscript that, 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 that rings false, it feels inside me the, it feels bad the way telling a lie feels bad, which it's not a moral compromise or transgression, but it feels that bad inside me. Like I really don't like doing it. Um, and so often the getting the first about 60 pages of a book is what really takes those years. And then once, once I really have the, the groundwork laid, it, it does move faster. Um, but I, I'm always jumping back and forth between trying to just write it out and discover it that way and then outlining it. Um, and I, I find it's a little of both at all, at all times. I'm really, I've been stuck over COVID. I was really stuck. So I was just forcing myself to handwrite chapters and that opens up new stuff. I make discoveries. And once I realize, okay, this is what I want to do. I have to stop and plan it again. And then I free write until I make a new discovery and then I plan it. So it's, it, it's, you know, a little bit of both. 
And, and you mentioned, you know, learning later on in the process that to never let the tank sort of go empty. Were there, were there any other things that you learned later on in your writing career that you wish you would have known earlier? Um, well, there's the business of writing and then there's the, the, the craft of writing, um, on a, on a craft level. And then there's the practice of writing. So maybe these three quadrants, so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that question in all three. If I kind of, have I learned or figured things out, um, in the, in the craft of writing, I would say one of the biggest things that it took me quite a while to figure out is, um, and I don't know if it's different in adult fiction, but I suspect not because I read adult fiction. Um, I do not think many writers are having um, truly serious conversations about point of view. Um, we have sort of the high school definitions and I carried these two of like first person, second person, third person. Um, but specifically when you're, once you go into third person, there is so much variation and nuance in the way, how, how tightly or closely that, that point of view is controlled. And uh, it took me, I mean, I, I had some feedback on my first book about point of view and it wasn't even criticism it was just observing what was going on in it and I like did not understand point of view enough to even understand what they were saying it took me years literally years just to figure out what <laughs> what they were even pointing at and 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 I don't find people have really good answers about on a on a on a nuts and bolts craft level about how to really handle POV but I think it's really important for readers um so I'm just to the point that I know it's an issue that needs to be cracked, but that represents a lot of growth for me. Um, in terms of daily practices, I'm useless. I have not figured out the cool little method. I have three small children and this has been a really rough quarantine. Um, so I just, there's no, I mean, now they're in school again and all of that, but, but the idea of the space and the daily practice and the meditative, you know, <laughs> writer's life, I, it, all that's out the window. Um, uh, and then, um, in business stuff, uh, I just wish I'd, um, I think I just wish I'd gotten off Twitter earlier and I got off it a while ago. I've been off Twitter for five years, <laughs> but I still wish it had been earlier. Um, so I, I find that stuff not, not helpful for me at least. And, and maybe I miss out on some opportunities. I know I do, but I, I think it's just not, it's not a good space for writers or for this writer. I want to ask specifically about Night Gardener now, because Night Gardener is, you know, one of the things that's often discussed in middle grade is what is appropriate for kids and what is not. And this is one of the darker middle grades, I felt like. And I wonder if it was a, a learning process for you of learning what can go in a middle grade and what can't and what the line there is, or if you even think about that, or maybe it just comes naturally to you. Yeah, uh, it doesn't. I mean, I don't know what we mean by naturally. It comes organically, right? I find mm -hmm. it. I write it. It doesn't work. I find it. Um, uh, Night Gardener is, is quite dark for middle grade, um, uh, but still not horror, I would say. I don't, maybe I'm lying to myself about that. Um, you know, it's, it's, again, when I talk about like sort of uh, maybe my sensibilities being harder to instantly translate into screenwriting, making more sense in books, you know, a kid can handle much more disturbing imagery in a book than they can uh, in a visual medium. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of kind of courage to, for people to put, you know, and, and I love it when, it, when I see, you know, a, a kid's movie do like a big swing. Um, like I think, I think some of the, I think some of the things in turning red are wild in terms of like what they're deciding to do. And I love, I love how gutsy that is. Or I even think like, you know, I, we don't talk about that movie onward a lot. It was like shunted into, you know, in, 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 into streaming right when the pandemic started. But like, if you, if I tell you that a major Pixar blockbuster with, you know, stars doing the voices and this huge epic plot involves a, a, a dead father's pants being animated, moving around with them as the only manifestation of this father's love. Like it's, that is a wild thing. And that, I, again, hats off to Pixar for being willing to do stuff like that. But generally speaking, that stuff works much better in a book than it does in a movie. It's a very hard sell. And, it, and I suspect of the people making those sorts of stories that have those big asks uh, didn't already have a really strong career track record behind them. People would have laughed them out of the room. Um, and so I found as like a, a nobody who would sometimes come with a pretty hefty premise like that or, you know, like it just wasn't 
I wasn't going to be able to convince him that this was going to work. Um, whereas in a, in a book, it's, it's not as much of an issue. So, and you warned me this was not a good story before the show, but I have to ask anyway, because it seems like a good transition. You're now writing, or you have written the screenplay for Night Gardener. So I'm curious how your experience in screenplay writing led you back to now adapting one of your books to a screenplay. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, the story's weirder than that. So the script that uh, was the nickel finalist was The Night Gardener uh, in a much earlier iteration. Um, in fact, I wrote The Night Gardener, the original version of it, it, it in, in graduate school. It was, uh, I, I pivoted out of playwriting and, and did a thesis screenplay, and that was my thesis screenplay. Again, wildly different. Um, and I kind of kept on iterating and finding the story um, that was the script that got me my agent. Um, uh, and so it, it, it kind of opened some doors and it was optioned multiple times. Um, I kept on running into this problem where like literally people would read it and be like, okay, you know, whatever the dude who made saw is really hot right now. We're going to see what he can do with this. And I'm like, Whoa! <laughs> we are not seeing the same story. <laughs> um, this is a children's movie. Um, and so there were multiple cases where like it, you know, there were people, serious people, great creative people, but they were developing it toward like a, like a hard R kind of horror movie. I did not want that. I, I, and, and, um, and, and, and then, you know, Peter Nimble happened and I realized I, I just, <laughs> that was stressful. Um, but, uh, and then again, I was able to kind of take Night Gardener back completely. And when I wrote it as a book, the, it became better. Um, I think there's a very safe argument to say that, like, even though it was a great uh, sort of calling card screenplay that showed I maybe had some chops, people couldn't get it across the finish line, right? I couldn't get it, you know, greenlit as a movie. Um, and I think that's because there was something missing. And it was only in the process of writing of writing the novel, The Night Gardener, that I, like, actually, I think, found the beating heart of the story. Plot po point by plot point, it's almost identical, um, but it's also, like, a completely different animal. Um, uh, and so once the book was published, uh, Disney found it, ironically, they had read the original screenplay and passed on it, <laughs> um, you know, a couple of years earlier, but they found the book and the book felt like this different thing. And so it was a very weird exchange where I'm like, you know, they're like, we, you know, I was lobbying to write the screenplay. They're like, you're not really a proven screenwriter. I'm like, well, I, I definitely have done this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and and to this to this day, like now, you know, I there's a handful of project my own books when they get optioned, uh, I I like to uh, adapt. I mean, I I am in the process of doing the screenplay adaptation. So so sweep is in development right now as a feature as well, and and so I'm in in the middle of uh, you know that's probably going to be animated. So it's it's a it's a longer treatment phase than just going straight to script. But um, so I'm in the process of doing that, and I like doing that. Um, but I'm not. I don't want to hustle. I'm not, I'm not one to kind of hustle and, and try to find, you know, or, or uh, sit down with a bunch of producers and have them pitch me on, you know, various IP and things like that. Um, that's happens uh, a couple of times. People, producers come to me with an idea and I'm like, the amount of legwork I have to do creatively to turn this into something, to turn your one sentence into an actual movie, uh, I, I want to own it at the other end of this. So if I'm going to do that much work, I'm going to write a book and then you can option the book <laughs> from me because it's, Again, I, I love just having that much control over my career. Um, you know, uh, I get to have a career. I don't, it's a, especially if you're trying to just break into features, it's a really, really rough gig um, for, for a new screenwriter. And whereas with books, I was able to kind of sustain and live and pay my mortgage and, <laughs> and do all these things that, that feel really wonderful. So for Night Gardener, you had the script, you adapted it into a novel. Did you readapt it into a screenplay or did you take the old script and just sort of? No, we out? chucked the old script um, and, uh, and, and readapted the novel into a screenplay. And I was really, I'm really proud of what we came up with. I really had a fantastic, fantastic experience um, working on that. And it's out of my hands now. It's theirs, but it was probably the best development experience. One of the two best development experiences I've ever had. I'm also having a really good time with the sweet people. Um, again, I'm, I'm really careful now, right? I'm busier, uh, cause I have kids. I'm creatively fulfilled cause I've got my books. So like, I, I get to be a little choosy, uh, not because I'm a big shot, but because I just have a, a <laughs> cause I don't want to waste my or their time and I don't want to suffer needless heartbreak. Uh, so again, it's, I'm, I'm extremely careful now when I do screenwriting work, um, who I get involved with because I, I would rather not have something not get optioned 
uh, than have it get optioned with someone who's going to just cause me headache. I, I got enough headaches. The world is hard enough. Um, and again, I, I have my dream job. So like, there's not much of a carrot they can dangle. Um, it, like the only incentive to me of getting a movie made is it would help me sell m- more books. Um, <laughs> like, like all I care about is writing books and getting books into kids' hands. Cause that's so rewarding and, and, and such a fun thing to do. So I'm, I don't have some eye toward kind of uh, making a comeback in Los Angeles at all. I, I find that sensibility so admirable because I feel like there are so many writers out there who they hear the word option and they're like immediately, yes. How, how do you sort of, you know, put up that barrier between what's right for you and what isn't right for you? Um, I don't know. And that's something I'm not very good at. If you talk about like mm-hmm. what I know now versus like, I still, I've often compared like, like uh, people in, in Los Angeles, you know, TV and film people. It's sort of like I, I maybe... I mean, this, this isn't what happened to me in life, but I could imagine if I'm like a sort of a, a high school nobody who somehow uh, got to go on a couple dates with like the hottest girl in the school and she sort of dumped me and broke my heart. And then like every couple of years we've like graduated, moved on. And every couple of years, like we're both in town for like the holiday and she'll be like, want to grab coffee? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah. And I'll like put on my best shirt and still kind of get my hopes up, even though I know. And she's just, <laughs> she's just there to fluff her ego and make me feel like garbage again for an afternoon. And, uh, and I feel like I like, you know, it took me a long time to even learn to like, be like, you know what, I don't need to get coffee with you, <laughs> but I was, cause I'd be so eager. I would still want that acceptance. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know if that, uh, answers the question. But... No, it, it does. <laughs> and, and last question about the screenplay element before we move on. Um, do you think you're going to take a bigger role in the production of it? Cause you wrote the script. Do you think you're, are you like, are you going to oversee other parts of it or is it sort of the script is off and there it goes? Uh, honestly, I, I doubt that. Um, I mean, the, the the producers are phenomenal there and it's Disney. They know how to make movies. Um, when they're ready to make it, they'll make it. Uh, I was really, it's it's already highly unusual for me to get to adapt my own work. And so all, like already a number of middle grade authors and friends are like, how did you get to write it? I'm like, well, I, I did that for a while. Like I know <laughs> I've had more training in that than I do in, in writing uh, novels. Um, but no, I, I, again, similar to the, again, that old, like metaphor, like, I just don't want to waste my time. I just don't want to get my heart broken. So pretty much like, I just kind of write that stuff out of my, my heart and my mind. I've got so much in front of me that needs my attention. Um, and it's, it's not healthy for me to like be looking for that other thing because I have no control over it. Right. I have control over whether I write my book today and with middle grade COVID made it hard, but generally speaking, as a kid's writer, you also have control over at least some degree of the sales of your books, because um, you can go into school library schools and libraries, and you can really connect with kids and you can kind of hustle your way into having a career in middle grade writing, which uh, my adult fiction author friends do not have as an opportunity screenwriting for, I mean, it's a different kind of hustle out there. Um, But I basically, I have paths right in front of me and they're good paths. They're paths that are rewarding. And so anything that takes me away from that is probably not the best use of my emotional energy. We can get to some audience questions now because there's some really good ones coming in here. So first question, did you have people in your life who critiqued your work when you wrote Peter Nimble? Uh, yeah. So I'm, a, I'm actually a super social writer. Um, you know, obviously I write by myself and I, I mean, I'm not so social that I can wrap my brain around people who co-write. I truly do not understand what they are doing. I like, that would be like, if there was another close friend of mine who chewed my food for me and spit it into my mouth and I do the swallowing, they do the chewing and between the two nutrition happens. Like I cannot wrap my brain around co-writing. That being said, I'm a very social writer. I love getting at the right stages with the right people. I really crave feedback. Um, When I hit about, uh, so with Peter Nimble, I had my playwriting friends. They weren't novelists, but, um, they were able to see even graduate school that playwriting wasn't a right fit for me. There was something wasn't the, the gears weren't lining up. This was a, this was a godsend because uh, being a playwright is just a terrible career. Um, there is no money in it unless, um, unless you're, I don't know, Kushner or someone like that. Like it is not a job to have as a playwright playwright. It's the first person who is asked to give up their money. If the production <laughs> runs short on its budget. Um, uh, but they gave feedback and most importantly, the feedback was this feels like a better fit for you. You know, even as rough as my first books were, 
Um, but you know, my wife reads everything. She reads everything multiple times. She is, is also a freelance editor. She has a lot of experience in this. Um, but I, I use every single book I write when I get to about the 60 page mark, I actually host a reading with close family and friends. Um, and, and we, and I have someone facilitate kind of a feedback session. Um, I find it's valuable to do it in a big chunk like that. Cause then a, a comment from someone won't be too destabilizing because I'll be like, well, I know a little bit where I'm going and what I'm doing. Um, whereas if I, if I just write the first chapter of a book, comments can really screw me up because it's so unformed. Um, and some of that's the feedback and the feedback's great. But the other piece of it is in the same way that, you know, I said kind of writing a bad line feels like a lie. Like I can hear it coming out of my mouth. And so just the embarrassing public social humiliation of saying a moment that feels false, saying a line of dialogue that was meant to be a joke and, and is only an approximation of a joke, you know, all of these sorts of things, like I feel it internally as I'm doing it. And, and that's a lot of the feedback I get as well. Like that, that kind of crucible um, sort of forces me to like really confront what I've actually put down in the story rather than what I think I've put down in my head. So then follow-up question to that from the Q and a is, uh, do you have a critique group? Yeah, I have, I have for years I've had critique groups um, and I'm actually thinking of, I, I had one group of actually all, women who are probably in the late sixties or seventies um, in Pittsburgh, when I first moved there, they were all children's writers. They still are writing, writing a, a, a kind of a diverse uh, number of different genres now. And I've been, I was like the young whippersnapper who came to their group when COVID hit, things got a little bit tricky um, at, because not even just because of zoom, but because I had three children who were effectively being homeschooled and didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, and in that time I started another, another group with some uh, some peers in middle grade we meet about every two weeks. Um, the writing stuff is very, very valuable, the feedback, uh, but honestly, that group is probably the greatest value is just as a chance to check up on each other. Um, you know, this can be a very, very lonely profession, especially now that we're not going to conferences and seeing each other that way nearly as much. Um, so, but yeah, so I, I definitely, I'm a big believer in writing groups. Uh, I love them. I think you have to be careful of who you get in a group with, because there can be toxic people there. Um, you really need people who know how to give feedback um, and people who know your work and know what, what it looks like at its best and what it looks like when you're trying to get away with something. Next question. Do you have any insight into how a writer can succeed in the industry without moving to California or New York? It sounds like a lot of the hustle happens in person and I'm wondering how to succeed when, when writing and submitting from elsewhere in the country. Well, that's a tricky one. I mean, again, it depends what industry you're going into. Screenwriting, I don't think it can happen anywhere but Los Angeles, maybe New York. But I, honestly, I don't know how you could be a creative person in New York at, at the cost of living there. Like, it just, <laughs> that just seems not good. Um, uh, it was absolutely instrumental as in Los Angeles. It was that weird chain of events that, you know, got me to. And it wasn't, even, I mean, it was literally, I was playing poker with a friend because I got invited because I was on that producing a poker show. And I met a lawyer there who then connected me with an agent who then connected me with the book agent. None of that would have happened if I hadn't just been young and poor and hungry in Los Angeles trying to make connections. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the book writing, I could have done anywhere. I probably could have done it faster anywhere um, because I wasn't hustling in other directions. Uh, middle grade, and I think publishing in general, but I'm not going to speak for that. Middle grade, you don't have to be in New York or Los Angeles, especially post Zoom. People are fine talking with you over a screen. Yes, when my book was going out to publishers, I flew out there for a week and I sat down with like nine or 10 publishers who were interested in the book. Um, I wanted to see them face to face. There can be some value to that. But um, I don't think for publishing, children's publishing, it's at all important. Um, there's a reason I was able to move to Pittsburgh, which you know, allowed us to buy a house, allows us to kind of just have a life and a family. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I've never wished I were in Los Angeles on a professional level. Um, but I know that's easy for me to say, cause I had the agent and sometimes you just don't. And, and I don't, you know, I don't know what it's like on the ground for people who are querying right now. I've never written a query letter. Um, and I know that's, <laughs> that's not normal. <laughs> I was going to say, I think that makes you the luckiest writer in the world that you've never had to write a query letter because that process. I refuse to. No, I had a, I had a very strict rule. I, I, I only rewrote my script. Mm -hmm. I only rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And I applied to those handful of contests and I, 
I swore to myself I wouldn't write a query letter because I felt I could feel when I would read like a book or a blog article about like how to, this is screenwriting, but like how to get an agent. I could feel all of my heart and my creative energy going into the wrong, going into blocked goals, right? Going into some imaginary person I was conjuring who was going to grant me the approval. And at the end of the day, like the, I, so I, I like made a, so it, you know, maybe querying would have worked, but I, I almost never see querying work. <laughs> Um, but I think it's a, it, it's kind of a, a pretty painful wheel spinning. It seems like, again, I, I, I just, I, I felt like I could have easily um, spent my first two or three years in Los Angeles querying and not just writing, writing, writing hard on that. I mean, just really that one story, just getting as tight as I could. Um, and I think I wouldn't have gotten anywhere um, if, if other people's accounts of the querying process are, are any evidence. Next question. Somehow you make backstory engaging and relevant. What is your secret? <laughs> oh, man, um, you know, this probably, I mean, so much of what I learned came from like playwriting experience. Um, the guy I studied with for my MFA is named Mylon Stitt, who was sort of one of the truly great pedagogues of playwriting in the 20th century, I think. Um, by the time, you know, his last couple, he died a couple of years after I graduated and, and he had turned into a say a pretty salty person. Um, if anyone watched the movie Whiplash, I had almost PTSD like symptoms <laughs> uh, while watching that movie. Um, but when he brought his A game, it was exceptional. And he, his basic approach with, with, um, with exposition, which is really what we're talking about backstory is to never give it until uh, the audience is salivating. Um, so he had a lot of, you know, it's like, well, so let me tell you the big secret. Um, ah, never mind. I don't want to. And that feeling right there that that creates <laughs> is like, no, I, I really do want to know. Um, and that's like, so his whole thing was just you tease and you tease and you tease. And then finally, when you, when you give it to someone, they are desperate for it, which is the opposite of like, you know, think of how many, you know, I, I just saw an article talking about uh, John Carter of Mars is a better movie than people remember, but it does one of the worst things you could possibly imagine, um, which is gives like this horrible info dump at the beginning when I have no desire or interest uh, in any of this. And and it was it was such a, a mistake because other than that, the movie starts really strong from John Carter's perspective and brings us in and you really don't need you know, how, how much more rewarding if I had been as desperate and disoriented as John Carter to learn that. And lo and behold, that's what Burroughs does in the book. So it was a really stupid move, I think, from a production level. Um, and it's, it's an example of, I think, people who are making movies sometimes, um, I don't know if they think, they think we're stupid or they think we can't sit with anything. Um, but I find if I'm teased out and, and, or teased by, by backstory and exposition, then when I um, get to it, uh, it's, it's really exciting. I also will have noticed structurally if people are super nerdy craft people, almost all my books are built around a sort of a discovered mystery by a child. Cause I think that mirrors the experience of childhood, which is this late childhood realization that, um, there were things that occurred that made the world the way it is. There, there's things that occurred to your parents that made them the way they are. There's the, you know, and, um, and so children are kind of piecing together these puzzles. Um, and there's all these pieces, but they don't have the full story. And I will say like, if you're looking structurally, it seems like I'm thinking of like eighties action movies and stuff. Uh, like the sex scene usually happens at about like the 60, 65% point where they've had some big chases. They got it past a midpoint. And then like the hero and the girl he saved get to like talk quietly. And it's like a quiet before the storm of the third act. And so if there's going to be like a saxophone playing and, you know, while those two are canoodling in a high rise, it happens there. And I often find as I'm writing my books that that is exactly where I have my big, backstory lore dump uh, because in a children's book, I'm not going <laughs> to pull out the saxophone, um, but it's the similar thing of like, we have the time and space. We just had all these adventures. It got really big and there's going to be an, another huge thing. And this is the moment where like, we're never going to get another chance for this info. And, and so I've found if, if someone's asking about like how I do backstory, I, I do find like basically the quiet before the storm of the third act. Um, if we're talking about three act structure, uh, that's the place that it it kind of naturally fits um, for me rhythmically um, and seems to work in the books pretty well. Next question. My children's novel has been shortlisted. The Fab Prize for 2021 
What do I do now? I agree querying is rarely successful. Oh man, I don't have a good answer. So, so first of all, I do have um, a little bit of a good answer. I mentioned that there's a bunch of like, I don't know uh, which what prizes do what, especially for, for novel writing. Um, this is a weird thing I never talk about, uh, but it's totally, I think it's valuable. Um, uh, so when I was coming out of grad school, I already realized I wasn't gonna be a playwright, decided I'm gonna move to Los Angeles. All my friends went to New York. I was horribly lonely. I think New York's a very cool town. I kind of wished I was there socially and, and sort of creatively that would have been a better fit, but there was, there were jobs in Los Angeles. Um, and, and, uh, as I was my last semester in graduate school, I actually applied for a grant and the sole purpose of the grant was to cover the costs of uh, screenwriting contest submission, like applications, which, you know, are not nothing. If you're trying to do a bunch of those, they're like 50 or 60 bucks a pop. And so I got like a grant for like $600 and I just applied to every single one I could. And I made, not with Night Gardener, but with a different script I'd written, um, uh, I made like finalist and maybe even like one, you know, or whatever. I I, I placed or whatever and, and maybe won a handful. And these were like very lower tier ones. They can't do anything. But I will tell you that it did help me when I moved to Los Angeles that I could hold my head high and say, look, you know, I, I met someone, they said they're interested in reading something. And I said, look, here's this script. And it was a finalist for this, 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 and this. And they haven't heard of what these contests are. You know, it's the real screen prize and the, this, you know, whatever the golden celluloid or whatever, like it's all this stuff doesn't matter, but there was, it, it, it helped me believe the fiction <laughs> that I could, I had, a, I belonged there. Um, now it helped because it wasn't my money, right? It was this, this grant I got. Um, so the question about being a finalist in, in this first, first of all, congratulations, that's an outside person who saw your work and validated it. And that is not nothing. And it's very easy to ignore the positive feedback we get because the tiniest bit of negative feedback just digs so deep into us. At least it does for me and a lot of people I know. Don't lose sight of the fact that that's an awesome thing. And you should be incredibly proud of that. Um, I don't know how to parlay it into success. Um, you know, again, it's one of those cases where there's like maybe a couple really big contests that like bring people to you. The nickel ended up bringing people to me, but I wasn't, all those other ones didn't do that at all. Um, uh, it's probably also evidence that that story that you submitted, it might not be done. Um, and maybe it is, but it's one worth continuing on, right? There's something, there's a there there. Um, I don't have a big, you know, thought for how to parlay that into something. I will say that um, um, publishing agents actually read their slush pile, which is not what I've been able to observe with uh, film and TV agents. Um, I mean, maybe they are reading, they have readers for them, but, but um, I think you do have a better chance at getting seen. I mean, no shortage of authors I know, especially middle grade and YA writers who were found in s slush pile. And then also if you're not connected to SCBWI, uh, it's an organization you 100% should be connected to because I also know a ton of authors who who found their editors and their agents through that organization. Um, it's it's very much worth the $75 a year or whatever it is <laughs> to join um, at this stage in your career. So if you don't know SCBWI, Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, um, you should definitely be kind of connecting there and going to some conferences and meeting some people that way all the audience questions for now. So I want to ask you another question about something you mentioned earlier about how you were able to quit your full-time job and, and focus on writing full-time then. I, I'm always curious, how did you know that that was the moment that you could do that finally? Because I feel like for a lot of writers, it's that goal of knowing that now I can finally be a full-time writer. So how did you know that the time had come for you? Um, I probably did it too early. I did do it too early by many metrics. Um, but also I didn't, uh, it, there was something very powerful about making that choice. And I structured my entire life around writing time. Even, you know, the moment I got out of grad school, like I, I got, I, I, I had written some scripts that gave me some pretty sizable, um, like, uh, grants. Um, uh, and, and there was, I had some prize money on some of my scripts and I, I spent every penny of it buying more time to write. Um, and it's still how I calculate things now. Um, it sounds silly and it's not good advice. I'm 40 this year. Um, and, and this is bad advice for other people who are on submission and, and 40 or, but there's something very powerful about the fact that I made the choice to make this my entire life before 
I started dating my now wife before we got married. She knew what she was getting into. You know, I have a good friend who his middle grade books started blowing up a couple of years ago, but he was an engineer living in Austin, which has suddenly become a crazy expensive town. And he's like, my family's used to uh, living under the roof of an engineer. And like, even though his publishing career is going great, like it's going to have to go super well before he could feel comfortable leaving that behind, or it would be reasonable or smart to do it. But I've been dumb all along. Um, I, we live as as much below our means as we humanly possibly can. That's why I can spend so many years between writing books. Um, uh, but you know, there were no there were no golden handcuffs. There was nothing to leave behind. I never I've never had a job. I've never had a boss. I suspect I would be almost uncoachable as a, <laughs> an employee. Um, and, and so at this point, I, I literally, my back is against the wall. I have nothing else I, I can do or know because I started that way so early. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that for sure. Um, uh, and it was financially very, very hard at some times uh, for sure. But um, I don't know. It just, it, I found having having a partner who could really, really support me in that and understand that like, you know, she is the one who tells me to not to pick up when I get movie option inquiries and things like that. You know, she, without a, you know, at the drop of a hat, I've turned down some pretty, pretty life-changing IP writing offers. Um, some part of me is like, I, I need to write that thing. I could get that money, you know? And, um, and, and, and she's like, no, 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 you don't, we're fine. Um, we can do this. This isn't, we're not fancy, but we're living. And that's like, she knows how miserable I am when I'm writing something I don't want to write. So. <laughs> um, so then two last questions before I let you go. The first one, you've given so much good advice so far, but I always like to ask if you could give one piece of advice to everyone out there, what would that piece of advice be knowing that they're all writers? Oh, well, I would say, I mean, honestly, right now I have been struggling with, um, so when I finished the manuscript for Sweep, and I did write a kind of chapter book series after Sweep, and those are those are out right now. I should be plugging them, but I'm not going to bother because um, I want to answer this. I finished Sweep, and my sense was that was kind of the book of my entire life. Everything I believed about the world, I wrote into that book. And I and as soon as I finished, I was like, if I walk across the street and get hit by a car, I'm going to be sad to leave my family, but I'm not going to be sad that I didn't write more books. Um, and that is a beautiful thing. I, the, the sense of completion and, and contentedness in what I created in that story. That's really cool. Um, it's terrifying because, you know, I talk about the well being empty. The well was completely empty. That book took everything out of me. And then the pandemic happened. Um, and so what that really means is, you know, you're talking to someone who, you know, I did do these chapter books and I'm really proud of them. And they're really fun. Um, oh, here, hang on. feels weird to reference them and not actually show them. So this is a new series I have called The Fabled Stables, which is books for younger readers. Uh, they were really fun to write and I love them, but really in terms of the big meaty novels, I've been as blocked as any person I've ever known for years now. It's taken me, I mean, uh, two and a half years to kind of get out of the funk and I'm just now sort of seeing the light of day. Um, so I would feel like a fraud giving any real advice other than the fact that it, it doesn't really get easier. Um, and, uh, and it, for me, at least, it's it's almost never fun, the writing. It's never easy. Um, so you really, really make sure that what you're writing is something that feels important to you. Um, this is not, you know, you can do a day job that your heart's not in. <laughs> you can do a lot of things that your heart's not in. I do the dishes every night. I cook dinner every night and heart's not in it. Um, but, uh, but when you're finding a story and when you find a story really really scrutinize it and make sure it's something that feels like must be written. And that could only be written by you. Um, again, I, I think it's, you know, you, each person, each writer is a totally unique creation um, and creator and fishing for that thing that really only you could write. Um, that's your superpower, right? Cause you're the only one of you in the whole known universe. And that takes a lot of work internally. Um, but it also means like letting go of like commercially good ideas that, that, you don't feel that urgency for, but for me, chasing that other stuff ultimately ends up in heartbreak. And then last but not least, and you've already done some of this already, this is your chance to promote things. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, where can people find your stuff? Where can they find you? Are you on social media? All that good stuff. Okay. I'm going to do two things. Also because in the chat, someone asked about my yo-yos. 
Uh, so oh, I do yes. yo-yo tricks when I visit schools. I used to be a professional yo-yo demonstrator. And usually I do like whole yo-yo shows, but I'm going to step back for at least one second and do one yo-yo <laughs> trick because I promised it in the chat. Um, I'm in my attic, which is very, uh, has low clearance. But so this is, so this is a, this is a Rain City SETI, which is a yo-yo out of Vancouver that I love. And this is one of my demonstrating yo-yos, but here's a couple of yo-yo tricks. Um, in terms of the books I've got. So I write strange stories for strange kids. Um, we've talked a lot about Sweep, which is very much kind of the, this book of my heart. Um, the Night Gardener also is this uh, kind of creepy haunted house story about an evil tree. Um, Peter Nimble and Sophie Choir are part of the Peter Nimble series for like kind of fun, swashbuckling, slightly sillier magical adventure. And then I have this brand new series, The Fabled Stables. These were written for younger kids um, because I was sick of not being able to find kids books that I could read um, to all three of my children. They're all differently aged. And I needed something that my youngest kid would sit through while my oldest kid would still enjoy. Um, and so these are books. They're not picture books. They're not even chapter books. The language is actually pretty difficult. Uh, they're hundred pages long, um, but you can read each one in about 20 minutes. They're not super long, but each page is like gorgeous full color illustrations. Um, we have the artist Olga Demodova who did the work on these. And so basically it's like a novel length picture book. So each one is like a perfect, like one read aloud to rule them all at bedtime at night for multiple age kids. Um, the third book just came out. Um, and the response I've got from these have been like overwhelming. I, I like the kids absolutely are, are going crazy for this series. And that's really rewarding and fun, um, especially at a time when I can't tour and hang out with kids, but they're sending me like letters and drawings and ideas for different creatures. Um, I didn't even say the Fabled Stables is about a little boy named Augie who works at these magic stables full of all sorts of weird, wild, one of a kind creatures. Um, and so every once in a while, the stables will shake and a new stall will appear with the name of a new creature in it. And he has to kind of go out into the wide world and find that creature and bring him back to the stables. So it's kind of new creature, every book, a lot of wordplay, a lot of puns, um they're kind of silly light books um but they were really really fun to write so well jonathan thank you so much for being here today we really appreciate you taking the time absolutely this was a blast thank you everyone who took some time out of their wednesday evening um and uh yeah thanks so much if you like this interview and you see it on youtube pass it on to other people i would love them to see it too if you found it at all helpful um and thanks josh for running a series like this what a cool cool thing you're doing of course. Thank you. Yeah. So to all of our listeners, we're back next week. We're on Tuesday next week. Same time, but on Tuesday. So we'll see you then. Have a good rest of your all day. Right. Bye-bye. Cheers.